Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Church Phoenix. We're so very glad that you are here with us to worship and sing together. Would you please stand? Start by singing a Christmas hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Thank you for the willingness to sacrifice yourself, uh, even to the death on the cross for ourselves. We pray that as we um, remember this Christmas season, we would not get caught up in the commercial stuff. And even though that's fun and it's fun to be with family, we pray that we would uh, continually remember um, what you gave up for our sake. In Jesus' name, amen. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Thou rushing wind. Thou rushing wind that art so strong. Ye clouds and sail in heaven no more. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Thou rising morning, praise rejoice. Ye lights of evening, find a voice. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Let all things there create a bless and worship Him in To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9-6. On the first Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of longing, a first light of hope for the long-awaited Savior in the midst of darkness. On the second Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of fear, reminding us that even in our greatest fears, in the valley of the shadow of death, God comes to us and is with us. Today, we light the candle of peace. The pink candle reminds us that in our attention to our longing and fears, we can rejoice in the message of peace proclaimed by the angels and accomplished in us through the work of Christ. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Ephesians 2, 17 through 18. This week, as we rejoice in the coming of the Prince of Peace, as his servants, we also remember our calling to bring peace, hearing the words of the prophet Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns, Isaiah 52, 7.
And uh, I just wanted to say how encouraged I was. I know many of you were as well. But to give you a little update, Josh presented a project that we wanted to partner not just with our own church, but with the Grace Gospel Fellowship and different ministry partners and missionary partners around the globe to turn a portion of our parsonage into kind of an apartment, a pastoral and missionary retreat center. And he asked for some pledges for that gift and that project. And we were overwhelmed and just so glad to know that <laughs> you all and we all want that, clearly, uh, with what has been pledged. And so today, right after church, I wanted to invite anyone that is interested to join Matt Bray and myself over at the Parsonage right after service, maybe about five minutes afterwards. And we're just going to give a quick tour of what we're thinking about so you can kind of have a, uh, a word picture of what we're talking about when we say this pastoral retreat center and maybe share in our vision. Uh, we will pray over that uh, center and hope that that project, actually that project will be kicking off very soon. So thank you for your response to that. And if anyone's interested, we look forward to meeting you over in the parsonage right after service. All right. Yeah, there is a lot going on in our Christmas season. Uh, first off, I do just want to say welcome to everybody who are here this morning. I'm so glad that you joined us to celebrate, to worship our Lord and Savior together as we talk about Advent and all the different things that happen during Christmas. It's good for us to be with friends and family. So if you're visiting with us, we'd love to uh, get to know you a little bit more. You can do that a couple of different ways. You can connect with us um, via the QR code here, but you also can connect with us with our uh, I guess it's the insert or the connection card in the pews. You can fill that out and put that in the offering bucket on your way out. And we would love to just get to know what your, uh, what your interests are as well as how we can connect and really, um, uh, I guess, partner together. The other things that are going on, we do have a lot of Christmas things happening. Tonight we have our children's play. The kids' program is going to be here at 6 p.m. Uh, just want to put that in your calendar come back. They've been practicing quite a few weeks uh, over the last couple months to, to present something for us. And, and so invite friends and family if they're interested in being a part of or just uh, being around with you. And it's a way for us to share the gospel. It's a way for us to share what the meaning of the season is. And so our kids have been really working on that. There will be cookies and fellowship afterwards. So that's another good reason for you to join us this evening. Uh, this next week, we're going into Christmas, which we're going to be doing a Christmas Eve service on Saturday at 4 p.m. Um, that's kind of going to be our main service for the week, so we're not going to have anything on Sunday morning, um, Christmas Day, uh, but we're going to be doing our worship service Christmas Eve at 4 p.m., uh, invite friends and family to this because this is a time where we can not only have a special, it's going to be a little different type of service that we typically do have then on Sunday, but it'll be another opportunity for us to be able to share um, really why we celebrate Christmas, what's going on for this whole holiday. And there are more people that are interested in being a part of a Christmas Eve service because um, we, we will have the traditional candles as well. So uh, invite people for a Christmas Eve service, but please be aware that it's going to be at 4 p.m. on Saturday. We will not have a Sunday morning service. And then the other announcement with that, and on the 31st, that Sunday we will be here, but there will be no Sunday school on the 31st, so no 9 a.m. Sunday school. And the other thing I just want to point into your calendars, or at least be jotting down, is our 24 hours of prayer. We actually have a little promotional video that we would like you to check out. In a world that seems to be spinning out of control, where godlessness seems rampant. And when difficult times loom ahead, God's people need to be courageous in prayer before the Lord. As Joshua faced a formidable foe while leading Israel into the promised land, God encouraged him with these words. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The enemies of God's people are just as formidable today. But the astounding truth is that God is still with his people, us, the church, wherever we go. Facing another year as both individuals and as a church, we clearly recognize that the challenges are great, but so are the rewards for those who remain steadfast in the Lord. James tells us, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And the Apostle Paul reminds us to be anxious for nothing, but rather pray. 
In this hour, we need warriors like Joshua, prayer warriors who will pray courageously and fervently as we face the challenges this new year will bring us. This is not a time to remain on the sidelines. It's not a time to remain silent. We invite each one of you to participate in this year's 24-hour prayer event. We encourage you to truly make prayer a priority. It's um, Friday, January 6th. We were gonna, we're gonna have a kickoff event here at the church, but then we're going to be praying throughout the night into the Saturday. Uh, we will be having a sign-up. The sign-up actually is live on our Church Center app. Um, there is a sign-up genius. It kind of links straight to the sign-up genius. You can get to, uh, you can sign up through that. If you do need any other help or if you would like help, uh, you can talk to Angie or myself to be able to sign up to the, the, the event. But we're looking to... Uh, be praying every hour, uh, because that is something that we do know God values prayer, and it is a very powerful weapon for us to be able to intercede not only for our own lives, but our neighborhood as well as the world that surrounds us. So please uh, be a part of that night with us as we go through our 24 hours of prayer. Right now, I'm going to be praying for this morning's offering um, as we do this as an act of worship. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the different things we get to do as a body of believers. We have a lot of Christmas things happening with the kids' play as well as the Christmas Eve service, but we also have an event where we know we need to be focused on our communication with you, that we need to respond not only to approach you with adoration and thanksgiving, but also with supplication and confession. And I pray that you would just bless our church as we do these things as we encourage each other with these things, as we grow in Christ together. I pray right now as we do give, um, that we're giving out of the fruits of our heart, out of um, of thankfulness. I pray that you would be using this in a way that would not only just bless us as a church, but also help us to do ministry that um, glorifies you. I just pray that you would be um, the one who guides us in the decisions that we make of how we use our money as well as what you are able to accomplish with it. I just pray for this morning's service as uh, Pastor Josh preaches. I pray you give him the right words as well as the words um, for us to hear in our hearts to, to change our lives, to live more for you. pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, kids, you're dismissed for Children's Church. It's always fun watching these kids run out of the building. And my wife made this comment, and I guess I've noticed it too, um, for the, especially the, those of you who are parents, th- th- there's a little more energy today in these kids. Um, and, and I don't know why it is. I, maybe they're excited for the Christmas program tonight, or maybe they're excited for the cookies after the Christmas program tonight. Or maybe that's why we're all excited about it too. Or maybe they're just excited. You know, they have two weeks off from school. I don't know. But uh, they're, they're pretty excited, and it's kind of neat to see the kids excited. All right, this is your official warning. If Those of you who don't know, um, Christmas is in one week. You got, you got your Christmas shopping done? Some of you are like, oh, yeah, I had that done a long time ago. Uh, you know, th- these days when parents purchase uh, presents for their kids, you know, when I, I grew up, you had no idea what you were getting. Now there's ways that kids can find out, and parents have to be extra sneaky, you know, hiding um, you know, search history and Amazon, you know, if you ordered things, but um, yeah, it's a little bit different today. Um, speaking of buying gifts, if you, if you do buy gifts, do you have someone that's hard to buy a gift for? You know, you ask them over and over again, what, what is it do you want? Please tell me what you want. I know kids usually ask their parents, if, if they're good kids, um, what, what, what can I get you? And every now and then one parent will be honest and they'll say something like, All I want for Christmas is a little peace and quiet. (laughs) A lot of parents say that. Maybe maybe more moms than the dads. Um, Maybe more for their birthday than anything else. But peace. You know, we we all want peace, don't we? And I'm going to go back into another slide. There we go. Um, And today we're talking about peace and what it is exactly and who we look to provide it. You know, there does exist an award that is given every year to the person or to the persons who makes the greatest contribution towards world peace. You know what that is? Can you recognize that? 
I mean, you can kind of see the name up there, the Nobel Peace Prize. And this is um, a will that was created by a man named Alfred Nobel. And he made this will back in 1895. So this has been around for quite a long time. And he was inspired by the belief in the community of men. And so in this will, he said, I want to, um, to, to give a gift. I want to give a medal, an award to the person who gives the most to world peace. And so um, the peace prize is to be awarded to the person who has done the most for fraternity between nations, for the abolition or reduction of standing armies, and for the holding and promotion of peace congresses. And so this is the idea that Alfred Nobel had. I want to give a peace prize for people who promote this. And I think the premise is pretty good, right? I mean, who doesn't want more world peace? I think it's good for people to try to solve problems and unite people and create peace. But I've noticed that this award has been given out every single year. And guess what? We still don't have world peace. No one has figured it out. No one has created something that is going to give us world peace. And I'm sure, and I don't really pay attention to this, but every now and then it says so-and-so won the world, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, and I might read a little bit about it. But um, I'm sure many of these recipients, you know, they've done a lot of good for mankind. They've done something that's going to really promote welfare and, and, and those things. But because there's so much evil and pride and selfishness in the world, the accomplishment of any one person is probably not going to do much to promote world peace. I kind of think about, I kind of have this, this analogy in my mind thinking about the Nobel Peace Prize. Kind of like all of humanity is in a canoe with a hole in the bottom of it. And, and sin and selfishness and pride is kind of coming into the canoe. And we give an award to the person who has the biggest bucket. And they're you know, taking the water and they're getting it out of the canoe. But the problem is never solved. There's still a hole in the bottom of canoe, the canoe. So, you know, is, is peace even possible? Is world peace even attainable? You know, here's a legitimate question. Is world peace something that we as believers should be praying for or striving for or really working for? I'll let you answer that question on your own later. Um, but the good news is, and by the good news I mean the good news, the good news is that someday there will be complete and total peace on earth. The Bible teaches us someday that Jesus will accomplish that. And we read of this in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. And so this verse is telling us that God's will is seen in Christ, and this is his will. Verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And so in the fullness of time, now, this, now we're dealing with the distant future here, okay? In the fullness of time, all things will be united under Christ. So there will be world peace. There will be universal peace someday. But we are a long way off from that right now. And so today what we're doing is we're talking about the third topic of our Advent series. And we've already talked about longing. We've already talked about fear. That was what we talked about last week. And for this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to consider how the birth of Jesus Christ gives us peace, not the total peace that we're going to experience in the future, but the birth of Christ does give us peace right now, and it does provide us with the hope of total peace in the future. But first, as we're talking about peace, let's, I think we need to understand what peace is. If I were to ask you, what's the definition of peace? I'm sure most of us would probably get some aspect of peace correct, but most people will define peace as the absence of war or conflict. And that's a, that's a true statement, especially if you're dealing with nations. If they're not at war, if they're not invading and fighting each other, then technically they are at peace. But peace is also defined kind of more as a, as a personal thing. Um, the dictionaries define peace as a state of tranquility or quiet. And, and as individuals, we like that kind of peace, right? Ladies, moms, especially with little kids, you look forward to that tranquility and that quiet, that kind of peace. However, 
the biblical definition of peace is a little bit different. It's, it's a lot more um, broad and, and all-encompassing. All so biblical peace is more than just the absence of conflict and a state of rest. Biblical peace means completeness and wholeness, and it really points to the presence of something else. So I want to give you the Hebrew and the Greek word for peace. You might, these might sound familiar to many of you. In peace, uh, in Hebrew, the word for peace is shalom. Many of you probably have heard that before. And, and shalom, according to Strong's Concordance, means completeness and soundness and welfare. So when the Jews would say shalom to each other, they're talking about this wholeness and this completeness of life. And it comes from the root word shalem. So shalom is from the root word of shalem. And shalem means to make amends or make something whole or complete. And it's used in reference, like one example, I'm not going to put this, this verse up on screen, but in Exodus 22, uh, verse 4, it says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep from his neighbor, he needs to restore or shalame what he had taken under the law. He needs to bring back to completeness. So you take something, you steal something from your neighbor, you need to bring peace between you. You need to restore that so that they are back to fullness and wholeness. So that's kind of one of the ideas of, of peace, that there's this completeness and that there's a wholeness to it. Peace in Greek is the Greek word irene. And according to the concordance, irene means something similar. It means oneness, peace, quietness, and rest. And this too, like the Hebrew equivalent, it originates from the root word iro, which means to join or to tie together into a whole taking broken pieces and bringing them back together. So, therefore, irene means unity. So when you think of peace, you should think of unity, bringing multiple parts together that were broken and bringing them back together so it's a fixed, complete, whole unit. Again, another example would be a relationship between two people. Something is said, you know, a, a mistake is made, and a relationship is broken. One of them needs to make peace with the other and apologize so that there can be reconciliation so that relationship can be brought back together. And so, the peace of God is different than the peace that the world is looking for. Biblical peace is more than just the absence of conflict. It's really when we take action, where we take action to restore a broken situation. It's more than just that inner state of tranquility where there's, there's the absence of noise and stress. It's really the state of being whole and complete. And so when God had the prophets speak about the coming Messiah, the one that we read this morning and the one that we're going to read right now from Isaiah chapter 9, it said that the Messiah would bring world peace. Not just the absence of war, but that he would bring peace to the world. Let's read that. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light shone. So you read that and you realize the people who are walking in darkness, guess what they don't have? If you're walking in darkness, you don't have peace. You don't have completeness. You don't have wholeness. There's things that are missing. There are things that are broken. There's incompleteness. And then in verse 6, this powerful prophecy says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. He will be the Prince of Peace. This Messiah is the one who is going to bring peace into the world. So for this morning, what I want to do is look at three ways in which Jesus brings us peace today. Things that we can rest on, peace that we can enjoy today. So the first way that Jesus brings us peace through his, his birth is we now have, because he died on the cross, we now have peace with God. We now have peace with God. Jesus is the reason why you and I can have peace and completeness and wholeness in a re restored relationship with God. And this is the one relationship that we need peace with more than anything else. We know that we violated God's holiness. We know that we violated his standards. We know that we deserve God's wrath. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, allows us to have peace with God through his death. Romans chapter 5, 
in verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And this peace that we have with God is more than just the absence of hostility. Or for us, it's more than just we no longer fear being punished by God. We now have completeness and wholeness with God. We are no longer considered objects of his wrath. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says at one time we were objects of God's wrath. But now we're no longer objects of God's wrath. Now we are God's children. We are adopted heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. That is the kind of peace that we have now with the Father. Jumping down to verse 10 in Romans 5, it says, For if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God, we have made peace with God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So, we now have true peace and wholeness and oneness with God. The Apostle John started in 1 John by talking about this restored relationship that we have with the Father. We have peace now with him. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3. Let me go back. There we go. It says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are waiting, writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And so here, the Apostle John says, because of our relationship with God is restored, we lack nothing and we have peace with him. We have that peace and that completeness and wholeness. Now, the second kind of peace that we have now because of Christ is we have peace with ourselves. Not only do we have peace with the Father, but we in this life can have peace with ourselves. And I think, I think I'll say this, and I think you might all agree with me. The person that we get the most problems from in this life is ourselves, right? We're the source of the vast majority of the problems that we face, and that's because we're sinners. You know, we're born sinners. And until Christ gives us that glorified body and we have the wholeness and completeness that he's promising us in the future, we are not who God created us to be, but we will be someday. But as followers of Jesus Christ, even now, we do have a new identity. And along with that comes this wholeness and this completeness that only the Prince of Peace can give us. I want to read this from John chapter 16, verse 33. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said to the disciples, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so now with a better understanding of what peace means, just consider what Jesus is saying here. He says, if you look to the world, if you look to your meaning and your priorities and your purpose in the world, guess what you're going to find? You're going to find trouble. There's going to be tribulation in the world. If you look to me, in me, you will have peace. You will have wholeness. You will have completeness. And because Jesus has overcome the world, and if we are in him through our faith in his death and resurrection, then we are now at peace with ourselves. We are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it teaches us this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 16, it says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't think about each other from this earthly standpoint. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are a new creation. We have a new purpose. God has given to us this purpose to go out and create peace. Peace between God and other people. That's what reconciliation is. So you and I are no longer at war with the world and the ways of the world. Now our priorities are different. Our purpose is different. 
And once we understand that and accept that, we can have an experience, personal peace. We can say to the world, I know it's kind of hard to do, but we can say to the world when it's putting all this pressure on us to think a certain way or to act a certain way, we can say, that's not for me. I, I, I'm at peace. I know what my purpose is. I don't need that. You cannot satisfy me. In fact, we can realize that there's nothing in this world that can satisfy us. And I'm going to say something I wish the kids wouldn't have ran out the door. But all those Christmas presents under the tree cannot satisfy you, all right? Even to the adults. Maybe for like 30 minutes, maybe at the most. But So just go ahead, take them back. You know, kids, kids aren't in here to argue with that. <laughs> but we can experience true peace knowing that someday we will be complete. We will be whole. We will be the person God created us to be. We will have those glorified bodies. And that hope gives us peace with ourselves today. A couple of verses that just promise us that this is going to take place. Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Right now, we are not experiencing the full peace that God gives us, but someday we will experience that wholeness and that completion. We will fully be who God created us to be. Verse Thessalonians 5, another promise. Verse Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do this. And so because we have that hope and we realize that there's nothing in this world that is going to satisfy us, it means that we can stop looking to the world for our completeness. Our earthly identity is so insignificant compared to our new identity that God gives us in Christ. I want to read um, a, a story from the Gospels. There's, a, there's many great stories in the Gospels, but there's one um, about someone who experienced the peace that God was offering her. And this makes um, everything that we looked at very relatable. We've been looking at some positional truths. We have peace with God and we have peace with ourselves and we can read verses and it kind of makes sense. But here's a story that kind of See, it shows us how, how that really happens in a real person's life. So Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. This is a great story about someone who was given peace. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It says, One of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city can obviously read between the lines what her profession was. A woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Now this was obviously a woman who did not have peace. She did not have peace with the father. She did not have peace with herself. She was seeking that. And she did not have peace with other people. Okay? She had no peace in her life and she had hoped that Jesus might restore her and give her that peace. Verse 38. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, and he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of, him, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell her, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Verse 49 and 50. 
Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Verse 50. And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This woman now had peace that she did not have when she entered that room. She is now saved by her faith in who Jesus is, the one true Messiah. And now Jesus says, go with peace. Now your relationship with the Father is restored. Your relationship with me is restored. And now your relationship with yourself, you have a new identity. Go in peace. Listen, only in Christ can someone have this kind of peace. And now with the last one, last thing that we have, the kind of peace that we have with Jesus, I think this might be the most difficult, okay? And that is we can have peace with others. But we have to pursue it. The Bible tells us that we have to pursue it. So we have peace with others. The reconciliation that we have with God makes unity with each other possible. Okay, that's the basis upon which you and I can have peace with each other. You know, shortly after Christ's resurrection, God revealed to Paul a mystery. He said, Paul, I've never told anyone I was going to do this, but I'm now making the Jews and the Gentiles equal. I am making peace between these two separate people groups. And in Ephesians, Paul explains that now we have peace, peace between people. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, and I'm pretty sure most everyone in here might, might be a Gentile, at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. He has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So now the two that had animosity towards each other, hostility, they are now one. Okay, now this is a a positional truth, but we're experiencing this today if we pursue this ourselves. And because we have peace with God and peace with ourselves, God tells us as we wait for his return that we are to pursue peace with each other, okay? Because of Christ, we can have peace with each other. Going on in Ephesians, later on in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is a a command for us, that you and I should be eager. We should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, that we are now one with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we, it's up to us to maintain that unity. And this, when we do that, this is a powerful testimony to the world. Because when you leave people to themselves, pride, ego, selfishness comes in and you see relationships being torn apart. But when people look and see an entire group of people that are all different on the outside and sometimes on the inside and you see a unity and a peace that they have with with each other, that is a powerful testimony to the world that there is something greater at work. And so when we pursue peace with each other, that's the testimony that tells the world that Jesus truly is the Messiah. Well, we got one more week. Um, I, I'm sure you're looking forward to uh, the end of December and the beginning of January, and I'm sure you have a couple busy weeks ahead. Um, I know that we as a church, uh, we have a lot of good things coming up, as Pastor Brent mentioned. We got our Christmas program tonight. We got those delicious cookies afterwards. We have our Christmas Eve service on Saturday at 4 o'clock. I'm looking forward to that. This is obviously a little bit different than what we're no- used to. And I know most everyone here is definitely looking forward to New Year's Eve where we're all watching the Michigan Wolverines play in the college football playoff. Yeah, and some are looking forward to Ohio State. But yeah, we can have unity among each other even because of that. I'm really looking forward to the 24 hours of prayer. We did this last year and that was a phenomenal event for our church. So we have these really good things 
that we're looking forward to. But for today, as we've been talking about peace, I hope that this motivates you this week. I hope that you think about peace this week. That because of the past, because God became a man and died on the cross for our sins, that we now truly have peace with the Father. We truly have peace with the Father. And we look into the future in the hope that we will truly be fully whole and complete and we will have peace with each other for all eternity. I hope that this is a very important reminder that as we wait for the things to come, part of our calling as believers of Jesus Christ revolves around peace. We need to pursue peace. Christ came to provide peace for us, and we are to be the peacemakers here on earth. I want to close with one last verse, and this verse is going to give us our marching orders for this week. So as we read this, what I want you to do, as we read these words, I want you to think, God wants me to do these things this week, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 13 Verses 11 through 12. Let's do these things. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now we want to obey God's word, so turn to your neighbor and give him a big fat Christmas kiss right now. No, I'm kidding. No, no, don't do that. Some of you are taking advantage of that. I knew that might happen. But we need to, we need to do this. We need to put this into practice. We have peace right now. We have it. So let's pursue it so that the world will see what they're missing. They need Jesus, and they can see what they can have through the peace that we can experience with each other. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much. We, we can't put into words how grateful we are that we now have peace with the Father. We are no longer objects of his wrath. You have provided propitiation. You have provided the satisfaction of his wrath against our sins. And now we have peace. We have peace. We are now children. We are now co-heirs with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is who we are today. That is our calling. That is, that is how we should be identifying ourselves. Not from worldly ways, but this is our one true identity. So Father, I do pray that we will put it into practice as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we will realize he came to give us peace. And as we pursue it, it's going to show the world what they're missing. They can only find this in you. In this world, we will all have trouble, but in you, we will have peace. Lord, help us to pursue peace. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we sing our last song. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of a dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and darkness pining till he.
Thank you. 